morning, everybody. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist interested in human learning, particularly children and adolescent brains. Uh, the tools of modern neuroscience now allow us to look inside while the owner of the brain sitting in a machine is learning. And what we're finding out in those studies is breaking new ground. And over the next decade, we're going to have the potential, if educators are listening and governments are listening, uh, to completely revolutionize the way we teach our children, uh, the whole educational setting. The bottom line is about neuroplasticity. It turns out that something our grandmothers knew, that babies learn really, really well, we can now uh, instantiate with measurements of the structure and function of the baby brain as children are exposed to new material. Their learning capacities are limitless. And we probably should not be surprised by that, but there's an, a great deal to learn by doing the experiments to see what are the principles of human learning in infancy, and can those principles of human, human learning be applied throughout our lifetimes? I think it can. So let's just look at some of the simple facts. I think most of you have seen this graph. It's just plotting the size of the human brain over uh, development. And by five years of age, the brain's size is 92% of its total eventual adult size. Why is it getting so big? Because it's building connections. So if you look at birth, 86 billion neurons exist, but they're not talking to one another. The job of infancy is to connect all of the neurons with one another, learn to communicate. So those telephone wires are growing at a rate of a million per second in that early period. And by the age of three, the baby has three times more synaptic connections than we do, and we have 86 trillion as adults. So do the math, think about it. And between that early developmental period and the end of puberty, we prune to specialize. So you've got this interesting contrast, the wide open, learn anything, ready for anything baby brain, and the adult brain with dedicated circuitry, pruned machinery that has expertise. So this trade-off between the wide open mind and expertise with dedicated circuitry is just very, very interesting, both highly valuable. A utopia of learning would be the dedication and expertise of our post-pubescent brains, our adult brains, and that openness of youth. That's a philosophical question we could entertain ourselves with for a long time. Our modern experiments are looking at the long-range fiber tracks. We can relate these kinds of measurements of white matter fiber tracks throughout the brain of the baby with experience and watch them grow depending on experience. This is just one child at seven months, 11 months, and 26 months, and we're looking at myelin. So myelin is the brighter, the orange, the yellow is the most myelinated, uh, and you can see the networks in these babies' brains grow. So the next time you talk to a two-year-old, imagine the circuitry that you're lighting up as you speak to that child. So this shouldn't surprise you. Once you've looked at the human brain and how it's growing, here's a, a curve that comes from psychology. And you say, what's the capability of human beings to learn a second language across age? We're not equipotential learners. The babies are geniuses, right? Linguistic geniuses. From zero to seven, we learn and absorb using implicit brain mechanisms, totally different from what happens as you reach puberty. Every two years after seven, there's a decline in the natural ability to learn. It isn't that you can't learn it, you're using different machinery, it's much, much harder. In fact, genes play a role past puberty. But they don't in the early period. Everybody learns in the early period if you're a neurotypical child. But in puberty, we can see the effect of certain genes on the capacity to do that new kind of learning. So we have been doing experiments. We're exposing babies to Mandarin for the first time during a critical period in development at nine months of age. It's like having Mandarin relatives come and visit you and live in your house for a month and 12 days they spend 20 minutes entertaining your child. What happens to their little brains when we do that? It's amazing. In those five hours uh, of experience that they have in 20 sessions, they learn so much about the sounds and the words of the foreign language that they compete with the babies in Beijing and Taiwan with regard to how their brains react to the sounds and the words. They absorb it like a sponge. They learn at an incredible time in development uh, when the window is completely open for that experience. 
When you do those kinds of experiments and you see that babies are unbelievable learners, you can't help yourself from doing this experiment. So after we saw how humans interact, the babies were responding to those Mandarin or Spanish speakers. We then put them fr in front of beautiful DVDs. What did the kids do? Crawled up to it, stared at it, looked entranced. Graduate students said, oh, they're going to learn. They're going to be amazing because it's so simple. That it's all there. What did the study show? Absolutely no learning. The brain and behavioral test said, genius learning in the complex social interaction setting, no learning whatsoever from the machine. OK, so what's going on? The social brain is in control. So we bought a $2.5 million machine to find out what's going on. What's the social brain doing? So this is magnetoencephalography. Babies are sitting inside of it. It is a technical tour de force. Um, we were the first in the world to put little ones because it's completely safe, non-invasive. The machine is on. It's silent. Baby's got insert earphones so that you, you can't hear what she's hearing. But she's hearing the sounds of many languages. And we're trying to see what's the machinery that turns on for social interactive kinds of of experiences. And what happens is you see the sensory areas light up, but you also see social areas light up. And most importantly, you see the motor centers that will eventually allow that baby to talk activated. It's like in AI, analysis by synthesis. The baby is sort of predictively coding, what do I have to do to join this conversation? You can see that working. So as you talk to a baby, Pay attention to the fact that you're activating mechanisms that will allow them to return that conversation. So what are we doing now? Well, here's the principle. The social brain gates human learning. This is a really new concept. We used to think of social as the soft, fuzzy stuff. Social is the engagement part of the brain. It, it, has, it controls both our motivation and it provides us with information. If you watch babies in a social setting, their eyes track the movements of the people they're interacting with. They listen to the foreign language speaker, look at the objects that she's looking at, track her eye movements. It provides information. It also provides motivation. The mere presence of another baby learning with a target baby improves learning. Just being with another child improves learning. So there's something for us to pay attention here. So if you know all of this, you've done the science, what do you do next? Well, obviously, we have to keep the rocket science going without the new studies that will completely enervate our uh, programs of intervention in the future. Uh, we will not be able to really understand what's going on in the human brain, and particularly in the baby brain. But I want to tell you what we're doing now with, with regard to applying this information. There's three interventions that are really working. Here's the first one. I'm creating bilingual babies in Madrid, Spain. Why Madrid? Because they have all their babies in infant education centers starting at four months. It's free or parents pay what they can afford to pay. So in 2015, we went in four schools. In 2018-19, we went in 13 schools with 800 children, randomized control tests. I have a bilingual um, method, 37 principles, a 32-week curriculum. The results are stunning. In um, one hour a day in these infant education centers, the tutors produce this kind of language production in English in these Spanish learning babies. And their Spanish stays at the same level as the control kids who are getting the standard practice in bilingual schools, which is sort of nursery rhymes and simple things. We're doing a very interactive, very intense, where the babies interact with the tutor, with each other, and in small groups and large groups, and they learn amazingly. At each of the four ages that we're testing, the English vocalizations per hour per day are five to 10 times more than those uh, of the children who are in the standard practice. So this intervention demonstrates that all children in all parts of the, the world can learn two languages, they can learn many languages. They are simply in need of the right method, which we now know evidence-based tells us how to do it, and at the right time in development. Here's the second one. We're looking at the effects of music on the baby brain, using the same kind of exposure at nine uh, months of age to uh, a rhythm, the waltz in this particular case. That triple meter of the waltz is a difficult uh, rhythm for babies. Um, in a social environment, 12 sessions, so they get five hours over about a month's time, and then we do brain tests and we track language development. 
what we see is that music exposure not only enhances the auditory system's detection of violations to rhythm, but prefrontal cortex where patterns are detected and attention is directed. And not only for music, but for patterns in other auditory signals like speech. This study shows why early experience is so potent. It marks the architecture. It sets the architecture up to expect patterns in the world, detect those patterns, and predict when those patterns aren't behaving accordingly. And so why early experience is important? Because it's setting up not only for the experiences that the baby is having at that moment, but for future experiences, the detection of patterns. Uh, that's our music exposure, but I don't think that movie works. Anyway, the babies pound on little drums to keep time with the rhythm. They have a great time, and their brains change amazingly. This is the baby in the Meg after intervention compared to a control group that doesn't hear music. Finally, we're telling parents everything we know about language. When you tell a parent that talking to babies matters, when you tell a parent that their brains are growing, when you tell a parent that parentese, this sort of high-pitched, slow, kind of beautiful sounding sing song language is good for the baby brain and send those parents home. They change their behavior, their child directed speech increases over a control group, their parentese increases and look at infant language. Well after the intervention and the parent coaching is done, the babies are on a new trajectory. We need to take into account what we know about babies and children's brains, apply those principles while children are in school, apply them to our own brains, and excite our minds for a lifetime. Thank you.